So um, I'd like to invite our panelists onto the stage, um, Tomio, John, and Lavier. And while they walk onto the stage, I'll give a quick introduction of who we have today. So starting with John Osaki, uh, we just watched Reparations. John is the filmmaker. And I'll introduce you very quickly again, John. John is an award-winning filmmaker whose initial interest in film grew from his desire to share the stories of the Japanese Community Youth Council, where he has served as executive director since 1996. Over the past few years, he has had films screened at uh, film fest festivals and community events across the country, and as a filmmaker, John views this genre as the next step in his lifelong pursuit of social justice and equity. Next, we have LaVere Foster, representing the African American Community Service Agency, where he is a policy and advocacy coordinator. LaVere is a New York City native who is passionate about helping others. He holds a BA in American Studies from Skidmore College and a Master's in Higher Education and Student Affairs Administration from the State University of New York Buffalo. In his years working in higher education, he has mentored and developed students as they look to enhance their skill sets before graduating and entering the workforce. He also has held roles in local government and has assisted in impactful legislation for the community. As the policy and advocacy coordinator at OXA, Lavier intends to get to know the residents and organizations in San Jose and advocate for policies that can positively affect the Black community. And lastly, we have Tomio Hayase Izu. He is the chairperson for the San Jose Naked Resistors HR40 subcommittee. Born and raised in San Jose, Tomio graduated from UC Davis with a degree in environmental policy analysis and planning. He has been involved with SJNR since 2018, which aims to mobilize the JA community in defense of civil liberties and social justice for all. He is currently working to build support for HR 40, a bill that aims to examine the grave injustice of slavery, as well as the lasting economic, moral, and social impacts of institutionalized racism and discrimination from 1619 until the present day. And so we'll jump right into the panel here. Um, our objectives for this panel discussion is to raise awareness of HR 40, build multiracial unity and solidarity in this local area, and so I'll start with you, John. Um, I'm glad that we were able to watch reparations today. Um, I was very moved and impressed by it. My question for you is, what do you want people to take away from your film and what is its role in mobilizing Asian Americans? Well, um, first, thank you for that introduction. I wanna thank the Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Festival for hosting this panel, and I, I wanna share a, a little bit about how this film came about. Um, I wanna acknowledge the Stop Repeating History campaign, um, which some of you may know is it's actually led by the attorneys who reopened Fred Korematsu's case in 1983. And really their objective in creating that campaign was to really wait, raise awareness of the many ways that systemic racism continues to impact this country. Uh, the, and the very unfortunate ways that we continue to repeat many of the mistakes from the past. And so this film really came about from a conversation that took place at the National Asian Pacific Bar Association convention last year, where um, Asian American attorneys um, and others who attended that convention were really talking about the role of Asian Americans in addressing systemic racism in this country. And I think for the Asian American community, we've gotten a very painful reminder of the presence of systemic racism in this country, uh, that it can be uh, directed towards us in a heartbeat when there's a national emergency, something that Japanese Americans know very well from our history and our experience from being incarcerated during World War II. And so the conversation led to how can Asian Americans think more critically about being allies to other communities? And how can we identify what I call opportunities for allyship? And the movement for black reparations was just really a natural uh, opportunity to uh, mobilize, to get our community involved in this fight. Now I had to approach this film with a, a great deal of humility because obviously 
I don't know what it means to be a black man in this country, but what I do know is that reparations for Japanese Americans would have never happened without the support of other communities and individuals like Ron Dellums, which we just saw in this film. And so I think it is so important for Asian Americans and our traditionally, historically, the way in which many have um, tried to make progress in this country was really to keep their head down, um, was to follow the, um, the cultural approach that many of us have been taught as young people that the nail that sticks out gets hit. And so we have chosen to uh, favor assimilating into the, dom the dominant white culture. And I think this moment really requires us to think about how we are going to build power moving forward. And it's my opinion that in order to address anti-Asian hate and other forms of systemic racism, as a community, we really have to think about how we build stronger connections and relationships and support the movements of other communities. And so I think this film was really about um, raising awareness, because I think as a community, that is something we can do, is we can raise awareness about the Black Reparations Movement within the Asian American community and really um, put forward the question, um, how can we support this movement in order to build power for all communities of color. Thank you, John. Uh, my second question is for Lavier. So recently, OXA was the um, inaugural grantee for the award Case for Reparations, a multi-million dollar initiative for reparations advancement to fuel and amplify conversations where wealth can be redistribu redistributed by institutions and governments to Black and Native American communities in the U.S. So how does fighting for HR 40 benefit OXA and the people you're trying to help? And what are the reparative needs of people who OXA serves? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, so it's, um, it pretty much shows that people are now starting to listen um, to us, to our community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, over the years, as there hasn't been equal access, whether it's to you know education, healthcare, you name it, you know we don't get the same response or the response that really helps us move forward. And when that happens, it really sets our community back because we're always trying to fight for equal access because of what has happened in the past. But it doesn't feel like people are doing anything to really, you know, help us create a better future for ourselves. And, you know, we have people, you know, who come to our, who come to our agency who need this access, who needs, you know, health care, who needs better housing. I mean, it just feels like, you know, as a people, you know, we were sort of like born like almost at, at the back of the bus or at the back of the line. And what, what you know, reparations or this idea of, around HR 40 does for us, it really makes us feel that you know we can sort of move forward in trying to create or advocate for trying to create generational wealth you know and what that means is like you know better health care better education you know being able to be born into a family and have you know all of that access instead of always being born into poverty into wondering what's going to happen next and it really didn't feel like it's your fault and then having to look for an agency or look for scholarships or look for something to actually pull you out of that mud. Um, so that's why HR 40 is, is so important to our community. Um, it's so, and it's really impactful to have community members come together. So when you have decolonizing wealth, you know, awarding us this grant, it shows that organizations are out there watching and listening. And, you know, as we have, you know, Congress members and, and everyone really starting to advocate for this again, it's, it really feels that people are listening. And with everything that's happened, whether it be with you know George Floyd and you know communities really coming together, it's that time for our communities to also continue to come together and, and not let this this die. You know this needs to continue so we can really look at what equal access looks like and what that idea of like generational wealth means for the future and try to and trying to amend what has happened in the past. Thank you, Lavier. I think your idea of broadening support across communities leads into my next question, which is for Tomio. Um, 
There was a moment in the film where we heard that every time Black Americans fight for justice in their own communities, everyone else benefits as well. And as an extension of that, I think that's because they're fighting for basic freedoms and rights promised to them in the Constitution. And historically, the Asian American community has benefited from black, act, black activism as well, like with the National Immigration and Nationality Act and the rise of yellow power following the civil rights movement. So now, why is HR 40 not just an African American issue? And why did San Jose Nikki resistors decide to support HR 40? Okay, well, um, that's actually a very interesting question. And it's very difficult to answer that within you know, such a short time frame. Um, but I guess one, one of the things that I really enjoyed about this movie is that it made it clear that when we're talking about slavery, or really the legacy of slavery, that didn't end in 1865. You know, we're, we're still looking at, um, when we talk about H.R. 40, when we're talking about the legacy of slavery and Black Lives Matter, uh, we're really talking about um, defending the Constitution. We're talking about making sure that the Bill of Rights and really our basic concepts of equality and justice, equality and justice are applied and realized to everyone. And I guess also just to sort of clarify, when I talk about the legacy of slavery, um, we're, we're talking about everything from Jim Crow, we're talking about the Black Coast things that were all mentioned in the film, we're talking about redlining, we're talking about mass incarceration, unfair policing. And you know these are all things that not only happened within living memory of people that are likely in the audience today, but things that continue to happen until now. And I think it's, um, it's very clear that especially, you know, after the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the widespread protests that followed, and really the lack of accountability that we still see, that we never truly address slavery and the fallout of slavery. And so HR 40, um, it strikes me as a potential vehicle through which we might be able to actually have a discussion in this country about that, and you know, to figure out how we can move forward. Um, and in terms of um, San Jose Nikkei Resistors specifically, I think it's important to understand that. So San Jose Nikkei Resistors uh, sort of has its roots within the Japanese American redress movement of the 1970s and 1980s. Um, a lot of our founding members at least were originally active sort of in various groups such as NCRR or the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations. And one of the core principles of NCRR was that, you know, beyond just the Japanese American redress struggle, um, it's important that we do our best to support um, to support those who are suffering and you know, continue to suffer from wrongdoings committed by the United States government. And although it has been several decades since that movement um, you know, sort of took off, uh, I think I like to hope that we can still embody and realize that mission even today. And you know, through, through our sort of our work within the Japanese American community, it became very clear that there were actually a lot of people within our, within our community that did support HR 40, that were very sympathetic with the concept of reparations, and you know, I think this is in part due to the fact that there are a lot of parallels between the J reparations movement and HR 40, at least specifically in the sort of commission style hearing, and you know, um, and all of that. And so I think um, you know, I can really only speak for myself and for Nikkei Resist San Jose Nikkei Resistors, but I think that you know, sort of through our personal and collective experiences with the internment and the redress movement. Um, I think that we know that you know reparations are more than just a symbolic gesture. Uh, they can, or HR 40 can and should represent a real and you know meaningful path forward to a restorative justice um, in this country. Thank you, Tomio. Um, my last question I'd like to ask of all the panelists. Maybe we could do a quick rapid fire around here. Uh, towards the end of the film, we hear from one of the speakers that there is no awareness of the continuity of systemic racism in this country, and that it's essentially time to face this kind of institutional racism and how it's affected not just the black community, but kind of this racial hierarchy, I, I think, as Susan has put it. Um, and so my last question to you is, why is HR 40 so significant now? Why does it carry the weight that it does today? Feel free to go first. Okay, um, well, I think from my standpoint, I think it's really important for us to be aware that those who promote and have advocated for systemic racism in this country have been incredibly successful at dividing our communities and convincing many people that one community's gain is another community's loss, right? And I think we have to really resist that narrative uh, and that this is really about healing this country. And I really want to make this point that 
you know, healing America, atoning for the wrongs of the past, whether it's for the black community, the Asian community, or any other community, is going to make life better for everybody in this country. And I think we have to get away from um, this narrative that, you know, if, if the black community achieves reparations, that somehow I'm going to lose something. And that is just simply not the case. Everybody is going to gain if we heal this country. And I, I, I'll stop, end with this is, you know, I was really moved by um, Congressman Ron Dellums and how passionately he fought for reparations for the Japanese American community. And I would ask all of us here today who are from the Asian American community, are we ready and willing to do the same for the black community? Because ultimately that is going to address um, systemic racism for everybody in this country. Right, and what I'd like to add, it's, it's not just a black issue. You know, this is a community issue. You know, so as we see, you know, for example, like with injustices with the police, how everyone came together around that, it became more of like a country issue, an issue happening within our country that we need to address. And that's the same with reparations. You know, this needs to be something that we see, that we can address um, because as we, you know, lift up one group, everyone will then benefit from that. Um, that's what I believe. Um, I think um, just to build off of everything that um, everyone else said, you know, like when, whenever, you know, I look, you know, I see films like this, like the first thing I always think is like the best time for reparations would have been 150 years ago. Although the next best time and really all that we can do is fight for it now. And, um, you know, I, I do think it is, it's very interesting to take it because it's very easy to get, I think, very pessimistic when we look at sort of the world outlook and everything, all the reactionary right wing politics that have popped up. But it is important to remember that, um, as mentioned in the film, I think when this film, this was filmed, um, two, two, three years ago during the last congressional uh, session, when I believe HR 40 had about 170 ish co sponsors, and I know today it has a little over 193, which is by far the large, the most that we've ever had. It made it out of the committee hearings for the first time ever, and the fact that it's even being considered for a floor, a floor vote, I think, is very significant. And so, you know, I think sort of it's kind of our job to really continue this momentum and push it forward because even if we can't get it done right now, we're building a movement that hopefully we can continue to push this, you know, to next year and beyond. Thank you. Um, that concludes our panel discussion today. How are we on time? We have five minutes. Maybe that gives us a uh, time for a question or two from the audience if you'd like to do a quick Q&A. Is there anyone who has a question if I can see? <laughs> say I, just yell your question out if you do have one. I'm not hearing you. I see your hand raised. Yes, please yell your question. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. I, I'm going to take off my mask because I don't speak very loudly. I was very interested in the part of the film. Hi, my name is Shirley Lynn Kinoshita. Um, I was very interested in the part of the film where 9-11 impacted the uh, hearings on HR 40 and all the reparation work that was being pushed. So what happened 20 years ago was that our nation decided to invest in wars in Afghanistan and the Middle East, $2 trillion. And we now have stopped um, doing that. So we there is money for issues like reparation, which is a long-standing issue that has not been addressed. So would any of the panelists like to speak to that particular issue? So I think, um, as you know, in my day job at, at the Japanese Community Youth Council, the one thing that we've learned and appreciate is that the federal government uh, doesn't mind operating in deficit. Uh, and so, and your point is actually very well taken, is that it's really just a matter of what is a priority in this country. The issue of available resources is really a non-issue. When it comes, when you think about all the many ways that we uh, invest resources in this country, um, that really is not the issue, but people have used that as a way to suppress um, and 
uh, and make sure that this conversation doesn't come forward because they, because basically they are part of a system of racism in this country um, and they don't want this to come forward. So your point is very well taken that there is, there will, there will always be resources to address these things. It's really just a matter of whether or not as a country we're ready to make this a priority. And I can add to that, it's really getting people, like making them care. You know, it just seems like a lot of people who have that power to make these decisions don't care. And it's really, you know, asking them the question and having them respond directly, will they help or will they not? Um, so, you know, as we have organizations keep making this push, you know, eventually, you know, it will come to their doorstep and they will have to answer, you know, does this really matter to them? Um, I think also this really does go to show that, you know, time and time again, we've seen that sort of the broader American public, you know, for lack of a better term, is not only very fickle, but also somewhat forgetful. And that every time it feels like, you know, we build momentum on a certain issue, if something else happens, you know, our, all of our attention immediately focuses on that. And as, you know, um, I think people like John said, you know, a lot of people sort of see this as a zero sum game where we can only give our attention to one thing and then we can't talk about anything else. And I know even on like sort of a shorter time span, I do know that um, I remember seeing some very interesting statistics where at the beginning of the, the George Floyd protests, uh, we reached, I believe white Americans actually were in favor of Black Lives Matter for the first time ever. I think it was around 50 to 60%. And within two or three months, that number started dropping. And so I think part of that is the news cycle has sort of moved on as it did during 9-11. It moved on to talk about terrorism in the Middle East. And so part of our job, like I said before, is make sure that people can't forget that. We have to make sure that we continue to have this conversation or else the problem will only get worse. I think with that, we'll wrap our panel. Thank you so much, John, Lovier, Tomio. That was um, a wonderful discussion. And we're and thank you again for um, preparations. It's an honor to be able to watch it today. And well, uh, thank you, Nikki. Thank you, panelists. I know there are a lot more questions, and we will be out there in the lobby by the step and repeat. So let's have a meet and greet and uh, continue this important conversation. So thank you, everybody, and thank you.